Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is James Aitken, the founder and managing partner of Aitken Advisors, a one-man macroeconomic research boutique based in Wimbledon, England, from where he writes notes from a small island and consults approximately 100 of the most influential pools of capital in the world. After a wildly popular show two years ago, James came back for another doozy. Our conversation covers the ESG tsunami and the impact fund flows will create on business economics, politics, and investments, the dynamics of Brexit and incumbent investment opportunities, China's evolving economic plan, and the tenuous plumbing of the U.S. financial system. Today's show is sponsored by Northern Trust Front Office Solutions. When I talk to investment teams and CIOs, they often echo the same concern that they spend too much time managing data and not enough time analyzing it. Two years ago, Northern Trust took a different approach to this problem and funded an internal startup called Northern Trust Front Office Solutions. They gathered together a former endowment chief operating officer, a front office technologist from a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, an award-winning design team, and a fintech company founded by a quant who coded for Harry Markowitz himself, working alongside dozens of clients to take on this shared mission. The result is a cloud-based, custody-agnostic platform that empowers asset owners with better operations and technology support to meet their middle and front office needs. Visit northerntrust.com slash solutions for more information. Today's episode is brought to you by Colmore, a group of former private market allocators who left the buy side to disrupt how private market reporting and technology is delivered to limited partners. Colmore provides allocators a real-time portfolio monitoring platform without the burden of extracting, analyzing, and standardizing their manager information. The approach seems to be working as they've partnered with three of the top 20 private market LPs globally, including one of my guests on the show. Colmore also pioneered an innovative fee validation service, ensuring that the fees and carried interest allocators pay their managers are correct. That service is offered at a discount to members of ILPA, the Institutional Limited Partner Association. For more information on Colmore's technology and services for private market LPs, please visit colmore.com. That's C-O-L-M-O-R-E dot com. Please enjoy my conversation with James Aitken. James, it's wonderful to see you again. Likewise, Ted. We're going to replay that first episode so that people want your background and experience the crisis and why you've become a financial plumber. They can figure all that out. I thought that I would just like to open it up and let you talk about whatever you're finding interesting right now. We'll go from there. Yeah. Should we talk about the ESG tsunami? The ESG tsunami? Now, by the way, I think that might be politically incorrect to say ESG and tsunami, but we'll let that go. But look, it's... It's something that's been building up for a vast number of years and all of us, whether we're all in with climate change or not, it doesn't matter. I think every thinking woman and man appreciates that we need to be more careful of what we're doing to Mother Earth. And there's been all sorts of clamour over the past several years and it's accelerated over the past two years because we now have financial policy makers as well warning us about the consequences on our portfolios from climate change. So there's this concerted push. And hand in hand with that, Ted, it's no surprise that all sorts of new ESG indices have cropped up over the past several years, that more and more capital has been directed toward them, that the discussion is getting louder and louder. And we reached a tipping point last summer. And one might be cynical about young Greta, And one could have many valid reasons for being cynical. And one could find the end of lecturing very tiresome. But it is impossible to underestimate the impact she has had 
on this entire ESG discussion, related to which it is going to impact the way all of us think about our balance sheet and portfolio allocations for many years to come. And Ted, the impact of Greta's intervention, if you will, has been to accelerate the discussion across all buy-side firms. And I was fortunate last November when one particularly good client gave me a heads up and said, look, my mandate is X. You would think that my mandate has absolutely no interaction with ESG at all. However, we have just had our global MD offsite and the boss man made it absolutely clear that if we think we're doing enough on ESG today, we are going to have to do even more. And not just internally, but we're going to have to be seen to be doing more on ESG. We have a corporate responsibility. And on top of that, we're getting feedback and pressure from all our biggest asset allocation clients, whether it be the sovereign wealth funds, whether it be family offices or endowments, but in particular, the millennial generation of some of the world's largest family offices, Ted, unsurprisingly, are saying, you know what? We appreciate we're in a low interest rate world, a low volatility world. We appreciate we should be looking for higher yielding assets. However, we will sacrifice yield to do the right thing for the planet. Larry Fink has released his dear CEO letter, which is very forceful. And it's crystal clear that BlackRock, at least in their active equities business, is going to be accelerating their divestment of anything that's non-renewable, particularly coal, and obviously, hand in hand with that, increasing their exposure to renewables, at least in their active business. And the interesting question becomes, what does it mean for iShares? And what does it mean for Vanguard? And we go down the list. The point being, I think it's impossible to understate the flow impact of this switch under the ESG banner, away from non-renewables towards renewables. Now, there's many caveats that no doubt you're already thinking about and no doubt listeners are thinking about too. For example, telling everyone well ahead of time that I'm going to accelerate my divestment from non-renewables is, you would think, a free pass for every algorithm on the planet. And to think about a tangible example, there's been a number of observations made over the past year. Oh, here's the market cap of Apple. Here is the entire market cap of the US energy sector. It's less than Apple, therefore it must be a bargain. Well, it depends. If people are going to be under more pressure to reduce their exposure to energy broadly or to tick a box or to fit the labels, then guess what? There's going to be this steady drip, 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 drip of divestment from companies that may on the surface appear cheap. So one would sense, therefore, that the refinancing problems of already over-indebted shale plays, for example, are just beginning. Who's going to refinance those businesses and at what cost? So we have this shift that's just starting. And dare I say, due to reasons of virtue signaling, public fund managers, listed fund managers, will find it difficult to buy distressed, if you will, non-renewable assets. And the only people that would be able to buy and hold non-renewable assets will be people who, A, do not care a hoot about ESG and all this labelling and virtue sling, or B, private balance sheets, private investors. And just to hammer that point, you may have seen, Ted, that in the second half of last year, Sam Zell and his friend Tom Barrett got together to build a portfolio of distressed energy assets. And it's not to lend or own the paper structure, if you will, of distressed US energy assets. It's to lend against the well itself, earn a satisfactory rate of return, and then unsurprisingly, if it all goes horribly wrong, you end up owning the well. Very, very clever work once again from the grave dancer himself, Sam Zell. So you've got this kind of nascent bid offer spread developing. Let's think about it that way. A bid offer spread between renewables and non-renewables that will effectively widen. The point being, Ted, that if Larry Fink is firing the starting gun, everyone else will have to follow. And to emphasize the point, BlackRock as a metaphor for this within their active business is one thing. But given the flow 
that dominates equity markets worldwide today. If the vanguards or even the iShares within BlackRock, all these systematic factor flows start to really tweak their models away from non-renewables to renewables, all of this accelerates. And I can't stress enough, it's easy to be cynical about this. It's easy to be cynical about labels. It's easy to be cynical about where any of this, any of this ESG obsession generates outperformance. It doesn't matter. This is about to accelerate. It's going to be with us for a long time to come. Now, the pushback is this, and it's interesting pushback. It's like, all right, we're all going to do more about ESG. There's going to be flows moving all day, every day. They're going to accelerate. What's the benchmark? Great question. What's the definition of ESG? Now, obviously, first and foremost, the relatively easy bit is climate change, renewables versus non-renewables, and people will focus on that. But you give Greta and her kin an inch, and they will take a mile. So where does this stop? And it's not just climate. It's the other parts of this. It's like, is Amazon paying their workers enough in their giant warehouses? Oh, what is the impact on all that fresh water in Oregon for all those cloud servers out there? You know, is that appropriate? Does Amazon have every square inch of their giant warehouses coated in solar panels? If not, why not? And on and on and on it goes. So we are incentivized, whether we agree or not, to keep up with the play. We are now incentivized to ensure that we minimize our exposure to non-renewables and increase our exposure to renewables. And again, the bid offer on this is going to be uncomfortable. If I am a gigantic European energy company, many of which unsurprisingly would appear to be trading at attractive valuations or at least unloved compared to other things, and I've still got a bit of a rump of non-renewable business, it's all very well to say, well, I better get rid of it. But to whom and at what price? And hand in hand with all of this, perhaps as intended by policymakers and others, the cost of capital for non-renewable businesses is going to go up and the cost of capital for renewable businesses is going to go down. And obviously, Ted, in a low interest rate world, the multiplier effect of that is going to be profound because the re-rating of renewable firms will be aggressive, as will the de-rating of anything that ticks the non-renewable box. So just to be clear and just to pause here, and I know I keep saying we can be cynical about it because I'm talking about myself, right? <laughs> I find the endless commentary from the do-gooders that, oh, you don't get it or you don't understand and there's a hole in the ozone layer. I find it a bit tedious. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter that the parameters, if you will, the margin of error around the IPCC's climate change forecast. Okay, we know global warming. What's the parameters? Doesn't matter. Related to which we can say, what is the actual ESG benchmark we're using? Because we think of S&P and Moody's in credit and what they do for credit investors. And what's the equivalent of that that will emerge for ESG investing? Is it Sustainalytics, which is one firm? Is it Bloomberg creating their ESG indices? I mean, who's it going to be? Perhaps there's more consolidation to come. But all of this is going to feed on itself. So again, we can say, oh, we don't have precise benchmarks, particularly if I'm going to be charging my clients fees based on my new ESG strategy. If the pressure is coming from both sides, if the pressure is coming from the allocator, the pressure is coming from the fund manager, the consolidation and agreement on what ESG benchmarks are, it'll all accelerate as well. So it's coming. But it is true what Mr. Buffett says. Some people have very unkindly said, you know, he doesn't understand. Well, I think he does. And the point he's making is that investing based on labels is no way to invest. You invest on valuations, you stick to your process, no matter what people are shouting about, and you just wait. And I think broadly the point he's making is that to change Berkshire's portfolio or to change your portfolio outright because there's a new clamour for some kind of story is, is perhaps unsound or detrimental to returns. And the other caveat to all of this is that Norge Bank Investment Management, obviously one of the world's largest or reported largest sovereign wealth funds, they disclose their assets in real time on their website, have done a lot of work on this. And if one looks at Norge Bank Investments Management's website, 
there's a lot of literature on this and they state we have looked at our entire global equity portfolio and they pretty much own one percent of every listed equity on the planet that's their strategy and we have scrubbed our entire equity portfolio from the period 2009 to 2019 and we could not identify a systematic carbon intensity factor it does not exist and i thought that was very interesting but again doesn't matter norge bank investment management too unsurprisingly it's norway is on the vanguard of all of this but have also quietly said because they can that while we're mindful of all of this we're not going to just automatically divest of all these good companies that we own whether it be shell or others because we don't want to harm our portfolio but again i'll say it again it doesn't matter the clamor is only going to increase, the flows are going to accelerate, and we need to be mindful of it and set our cynicism aside. What inning in this baseball game or cricket match <laughs> test are we in in the actual flows? So there's no doubt that there's more discussion and the trend is picking up. Bottom of the second, long way to go. Yeah, And public markets more than private? Yeah, I think so, because by definition, they probably afford more liquidity to shift portfolios, but it has an impact on public and private markets as well. And there's a risk here it becomes self-fulfilling, and there's a very strong risk that this ultimately has political consequences. Take an Australian example. The big banks have said, we are no longer going to lend to coal projects. Well, I get that, but then extrapolate that. If I'm not lending to coal projects, should I be giving mortgages to coal miners? How does that play out? And if we're going to cut financing to beautiful bigly coal projects in Kentucky, the Appalachians and everything else, you know, what are the political consequences of that in an election year in the United States? How do they feel about it? And on and on we go. So I'm not sure that people have thought through the political consequences. And when you have some of the world's leading financial officials jumping up and down and saying, hey, look, Mr. Pension Fund, look, Mr. Insurance Fund, you really need to think about your tail risk to all this non-renewable exposure because it's a financial stability risk, well, guess what? In a compliance-driven and regulation-driven age, not to mention a litigious age, I can't afford to be wrong. I may not agree with it, but I can't afford to be wrong. So if you agree with the thesis and you want to get ahead of that tsunami, what do you recommend you do with your portfolio? Well, first and foremost, scrub it. And then, alas, think about which labels others might apply to it. Now, if I'm fortunate to have been ahead of this, there's not much else I have to do because I may have already tilted it towards renewables or at least thought deeply about the climate slash ESG impact of my existing assets and how I might be hurt if the divestment comes. So ideally, I've already ad adjusted. In terms of the range of assets I'm thinking about, well, get me listed wind farms, get me clean tech, you know, we go down the list, get me all that sort of stuff, get me out of Shell, great company, but get me out because I can't be seen to have too much, get me out of Total, and as we were discussing earlier, this is an important point. It's not just the investors that are thinking about this transformation, Ted, it's also the companies. They're not sitting still waiting to be punched by the divestment whether it be British Petroleum, now known as Beyond Petroleum. They tried that change a decade ago. It didn't quite work out for them. But Total, gigantic European energy company, well run, good shape, now one of the world's largest forestry businesses. Airports, not that LaGuardia is a tremendous example of a world-class airport, Ted, but should the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey stand there or have people stand at the entrance to Newark, JFK and LaGuardia flight shaming passengers and telling them to go home and get a bus or something. Where does it end? But it's a serious point because an airport in a low interest rate world is a great asset, tangible asset, gives you plenty of duration. But to see what some of these listed airport companies around the world, such as Sydney Airport, for example, which I think of as a monopoly toll bridge, the effort they've had to put in ESG to appease their investors is mammoth and will only grow. So the companies that are on the front foot, confronting it, educating their investors, green, green, green all the way, solar panels on every terminal, Heathrow, for example, well, that's privately owned, but you get the gist of it. 
So I need to think about the efforts that my portfolio companies are making to comply. And metaphorically, at least, I might be no different in my private capacity. If every portfolio manager at BlackRock, for example, is expected, no matter what their mandate, to start every conversation with their portfolio companies with ESG and what are you doing, I might need to do the same thing if I'm thinking about my own exposure. Because if I'm trying to avoid getting caught up in this transition, I need to think like the biggest people on the street as well. When you get into the weeds of implementation on a portfolio, are there clear enough definitions at this point, at least within some bounds of what constitutes good and what constitutes bad? Yes, because there are already plenty of existing ESG strategies and ESG indices, whether it be ES, uh, Bloomberg or MSCI, and we can go down the list. Of course, they exist, and there are already some very successful long-only ESG businesses, and they're doing well. Now, the question of whether you actually outperform over a sustained period of time or not, again, is not material. I think anyone who can create one of these businesses is on a winner. The definitions, I think it comes down to justifying the fees. And let's take a hypothetical. And you would think a way to really benefit from a business perspective from capturing this flow is creating something like a global absolute return ESG fund because there's any number of allocators lined up to invest in that, ticks the box, and off you go. So you start first and foremost, oh, I think I'll try and get short a few non-renewable things and get long renewables and off I go and you should have a heck of a lot of capacity but of course if I'm hopeful of charging two and twenty if I'm lucky or one and ten if I'm fortunate then I need to be extremely precise about the benchmarks I am applying to the companies in my hypothetical global absolute return ESG strategy but this is a hiccup or a minor speed bump that won't impede this transition and people will figure it out i know there are people out there working on it there are one or two businesses out there already seeking to capture this but i find it interesting that so far we're not hearing about the multi multi billion dollar global esg absolute return fund yet but i would think it's not far away a lot of other big topics in the macro world to turn to Thoughts on Brexit? There's an important caveat, Ted, because I live in Wimbledon and I've been there for 20 years and it's impossible when you're raising a young family in England to be objective. It's very, very hard, right? I mean, I try. However, isn't it interesting that throughout this often too shambolic process that Brexit has created two of the best investment opportunities of the past three and a bit years. Now, isn't that interesting? Now, that's not hindsight, and I'll explain why. The Brexit referendum was always too close to call. A lot of people were saying this is a rerun of 1975. No one could be as stupid as to vote leave, like me, for example. And unlike 1975, the polls in the initial UK referendum to join the European community were consistently two-thirds were going in. It was never in doubt. By the time June 2016 came around, the polls were too close to call, but, oh, we're finance, we're very smart, there is no way this can happen. Well, guess what? It happened. And in the lead-up to the event, I had to be very, very careful because my clients were very wound up about it. And if I revealed that I was going to vote leave, oh, well, you know, you're one of them, right? You're one of those people. Okay, fair enough. But let's work on a plan because I thought it could happen. And it was an intellectual challenge to work with some of my largest asset allocation clients around the world and say, look, this could happen. Let's not predict it. Let's not hedge it. Let's have a plan. And it happened. And you knew if you'd been paying attention to the process that, yes, there might be a vote to leave, but then nothing would happen until someone triggered Article 50. And in a world of even then fairly elevated assets, and all of a sudden Mr. Market offers you 40 to 50% off blue ribbon UK assets, 
many of whom's prospects were improved as a result of the vote to leave, what are you going to do? And that three-week window after the referendum was a phenomenal investment opportunity, at least for several of the people I work with. So that's the first observation. It's like, okay, this could be really bad. My inbox is full of commentary as to why it either cannot happen or if it does, it's a catastrophe. Aided and abetted by the chattering classes, basically telling everyone that this was a catastrophe. And it was not. Now, to be clear, as we move through 2018 and 2019, especially 2019, things became more complicated. So one had to be nimble and take some profit. But here's where I'm cutting to the chase. Boris Johnson, this great Satan of the Brexit process, or at least according to the consensus narrative, oh my gosh, he's prime minister, no deal Brexit on the table, get out. Sterling goes down, everyone's commenting on the headlines, and too much of the punditry, if you will, was just endless commentary on the headlines and spin. It was not intelligence. And yet if one stepped back from all that cacophony, there was something really important happening. And this is an important distinction between narrative, punditry, opinion, and intelligence. And what Boris Johnson was doing through the summer of 2019 was absolutely brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. He was building personal relationships, which unfortunately Prime Minister May was not terribly good at doing. And Boris Johnson charmed the pants off, probably a bad metaphor, unfortunately, but he charmed the pants off his European peers. He worked with them closely. He built personal relationships. He explained what he was trying to do, how he was trying to move forward, how he was trying to end the process. And the great shock for a lot of people is that Boris Johnson's opinion on no-deal Brexit actually changed. Thanks to his personal charm, he got the withdrawal deal reopened and redone. One can rightly quibble about what's in this new withdrawal bill, but he was constantly changing the story and creating an opportunity. And to give a tangible example, Boris Johnson, when he was mayor of London, was a leading advocate for same-sex marriage. Now, what the hell's that got to do with Brexit? Well, actually, a lot. Because one of the key people in this Brexit process has been the Irish Prime Minister, Mr. Varadkar, who is most unusual man. He is Indian, he is Irish, he is gay. And that effort that Boris Johnson made, and he was on the phone most days last summer to Mr. Varadkar, helping him reopen the deal and build a personal relationship, paid off in spades. That personal relationship that was barely reported, but it was Boris Johnson deploying his charm to move this process forward. And there was a nervous moment, you may have seen this, where Varadka got a bit wobbly. And there was this meeting between Boris Johnson and the Irish Prime Minister, I won't say precisely where, but it's near Liverpool, which is vaguely northwest England, and symbolically halfway roughly between Dublin and London. And they met in this country house because Varadka and Johnson had worked out a deal on the Irish border to reopen the withdrawal agreement and move the Brexit process forward. Varadka got the wobbles. Johnson said, I want to come and talk to you. And as I think many listeners know, Johnson has this senior advisor called Dominic Cummins, who was a key engineer of the vote to leave. I think one of the best things Dominic Cummins has going for him is that most people inside the M25 and certainly in Whitehall think he's a lunatic. But he's one of the most well-read people one can come across. Dominic Cummins portrays himself as this rebel, turns up at Downing Street, not in a suit and tie, you know, like a beanie and a top and a toque, as they say in Canada and whatever, just looking like he's walked out of a pub. And then you see the footage of this meeting between Boris Johnson and Varadkar near Liverpool. And there's Dominic Cummins wearing a suit. What? And the market was going off, oh, this is all falling apart. Got to sell sterling. No deal Brexit's on the table. This is all going wrong. It's going to disintegrate. And you see footage of Dominic Cummins wearing a suit. They're not there to blow it up. They're there to do a deal and transact. And you were looking at sterling and sterling assets. And they're all leaking. They're under pressure. People are hedging. And Dominic Cummins is wearing a suit. That's the intelligence. Now, 
For an asset allocator, this is really hard. There's a lot of things happening in the world and to take a deep interest in what's happening in the UK in this inexorable Brexit process and all the confusion, you know, it's a marathon. However, we're on the front edge of a very interesting experiment to say the least. We have ultra loose monetary policy in the United Kingdom. Wages are rising. We have an end of austerity. And come March, we'll have a budget where the UK wants to spend money. So it's a very interesting macroeconomic experiment, Ted. Unsurprisingly, as has been the case with European equities over the past two years, there's been a steady divestment. Oh, I can't have exposure to that. There's Brexit risk, both in UK equities and certain European equities. Get me out, get me out. So the flow's been consistently negative. And look, It remains a complicated process, these negotiations, and people, the day after the election, which I won't talk about, which chopped off Corbyn tail risk, which is good, there was a re-rating of sterling assets and a re-rating of European assets, but there's a long, long way to go. But for the sake of time, when one sits down with leading negotiators in Brussels, they too would like to get this done as quickly and as calmly as possible. And as dangerous as this assertion I'm about to make will sound here in January with a lot of Brexit negotiation to come, I think there's a good chance that we have the bare bones of a deal, if you will, about the future relationship between the United Kingdom and the European Union. I think we have the bare bones of a deal by the summer. So there's this fog of negativity and uncertainty, but my sense is that in this era of fairly fully priced assets all around the world, there's not too many opportunities, not too many special situations in liquid markets. So I'm trying to encourage my clients and others to keep an open mind about the opportunity in sterling assets. I'm trying to encourage them to think about longer term opportunities, particularly outside London, a lot of which are not often reported And I'm also related to this, Ted, trying to say, look, to be consistent, if you think that we have reduced, not eliminated, but if we have largely eliminated the left tail of a no-deal Brexit and all the chaos that that would ensure, if there actually is an undercurrent of goodwill between London and Brussels to get this done, then you need to keep your eye on these opportunities, not just in sterling, but also European assets and European equities, I should say. And again, there's been this steady divestment from Eurozone equities for two years. And if the Brexit thing can be largely, I won't say solved, but mitigated, then obviously that does wonders for Eurozone business confidence as well. So I'm trying to encourage clients to think about, look, in this endless hunt for yield all around the world, I fear that some people are doing some very silly things, taking too much credit duration, selling too much volatility. We can go down the list. And yet we have Blue Ribbon UK and Blue Ribbon household names, European equities, that have double-digit free cash flow yields, great balance sheets, great businesses, and also high dividend yields. And people are like, oh, it's all too hard. I don't quite understand it. So I'm trying to keep an open mind through this process. It's very difficult to do when you're sitting in London because the commentary is endlessly skewed to what can go wrong. And the takeaway is this, don't overlook, I guess we might call it nascent opportunities in UK equities in particular, and to be consistent in a fairly fully priced world of brisk assets, let's not overlook opportunities in Eurozone equities as well. And there's been this constant outflow from both over the past couple of years. And I would think is all it would take is a minor turn in those outflows to generate a fairly substantial re-rating in both UK equities and Eurozone equities in particular. What do you think the order of magnitude of that potential move is and over what period of time? Assuming there's not much volatility in the economic data, assuming endless generosity or consistency from central banks, assuming that inflation remains fairly stable to low, all those things that we're dealing with today, and assuming that asset allocators everywhere are still chafing with incredibly and possibly high hurdle rates, 
my sense would be that if you give me a high free cash flow yield or a high dividend yield on a decent European equity, that the re-rating could be several handles here. Multiples, I should say. I think we've got a fair way to go. Look, to be clear, perhaps not as exciting for some as the ESG hockey stick, if you will, but certainly some potential. How about turning to China? A lot going on, the trade war and changes in the economic picture domestically. It's breathtaking to watch what is the biggest macro prudential experiment of all, which is China trying to come to grips with its shadow banking sector. And for the past two and a half years, China has been focused on a deleveraging campaign. And there's been endless commentary over the past two years about how China must stimulate or something's going to break or something's going to blow up or the renminbi's going to go down. You know, it's endless commentary about what can go wrong. Now, to be clear, shadow credit creation, if you will, in China has been the engine of growth. And for two and a half years, the Chinese have not been trying to deflate shadow banking as much as arrest the growth of it. And they know full well that from time to time that will cause problems in terms of credit intermediation to households and SMEs, which are critical. We saw an example of that in late 2018. So successful was the deleveraging campaign, if you want to think about it that way in China, that they turned the spigots off too much, that the credit stopped flowing to households and SMEs, and then in early 2019, they had to correct again. Well, what's interesting is through most of last year, especially the last two quarters, Ted, the commentary was, oh, trade war, Chinese economy slowing. Yes to both. Oh, there's some problems with credit provision to SMEs and households, ongoing problems, frankly, that the Chinese authorities are trying to sort out because they've been too successful. Oh, the Chinese must open the spigots and stimulate and all sorts of things. And they haven't done it. And then we get to early December. And you know how obsessed everyone is with every utterance from the Fed and Jay Powell or what's Madame Lagarde's outfit colour today. You know, it just goes on and on. Central bankers have become celebrities. So there's a focus on that and a necessary focus on what central bankers are saying and doing. And then you've got the PBOC and the governor's name is Yi Gang. And in early December, he wrote this article for the CCP's magazine, Kui Shi. And he was basically saying, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, look, We studied what went wrong in the West. We're not going to make that mistake. We don't believe in depreciating the renminbi. He went down the list and basically said, no, no, no. We are going to stick to this deleveraging campaign. We are not going to stimulate the economy like we did in 09 and 16. We're going to be very disciplined. We are seeking to make the Chinese financial system fit for purpose. Now, that's no small task. When you've got the spigots open for all these years, just turning it on, to try and dial that all back, they know there'll be consequences. So it is therefore no surprise that we're seeing many more headlines about increasing defaults in China. It is no surprise that we're seeing more noise around disposal of NPLs. It is no surprise that we are seeing smaller banks get into real difficulty. And it's no surprise that all of this is very complicated and might require more activity from the People's Bank of China to ensure that the system runs smoothly and that the deleveraging campaign does not take on a life of its own. But so far, so good. Now, for obvious political reasons, the Chinese leadership needs to keep households and SMEs happy. But they're still working on ways to ensure that the credit provision via the financial system, so via the big policy banks downstreaming to tier two and tier three banks in Chinese financial markets, provides adequate ongoing credit to SMEs and households. They haven't quite figured it out, but again, so far, so good. And as much as people got excited about the People's Bank of China cutting rates in inverted commas to start this year, that was merely a dab of liquidity to underwrite what is this breathtaking transition for the Chinese financial system. So will they make mistakes? Yes. Have they made mistakes? Yes. But it's breathtaking to watch. And the next step might be the really hard step because they're really trying to clean up the MPLs now. 
They're really trying to clean up the banking system. So I would think this year is a challenging year for them. I think you should expect many more headlines. But if the past two and a half years is a rough guide on the ability of Chinese financial officials to pull this all off, you would bet with them, not against them. Now, in terms of what that all means for our portfolios, I wish I had a clever soundbite, but I don't. At the most basic level, it means we should all pencil in a much lower rate of Chinese trend growth, but that's obvious. So it means at the margin that China's not going to be exporting inflation, they're going to be sort of a curb, if you will, on global growth, or at least a lower trend compared to previous years. I think markets have largely priced that in. For the courageous investor who's prepared to read Mandarin prospectuses and everything else, perhaps there's something really clever to be done in the capital structure of Chinese banks and all these other things. I don't know. But in terms of watching this process closely and in terms of being impressed how Chinese financial officials, at least, have tried to learn from what the West did not do in the lead up to 2007. You know, that's probably the right thing to do. Learn from others' mistakes. Don't repeat it. Come to grips with the exponential growth in off-balance sheet credit and everything else in China. And if you're confident you can control that, then guess what? You probably have made your financial system fit for purpose for the long haul, which is what these guys are all about, the long haul. And look, just a quick rider on all of that. Yeah, the trade wars occupied a lot of my time. Unsurprisingly, it's had an impact on manufacturing P&I and everything else. But beyond that, it's remarkable how resilient, for example, the US consumer has been throughout all of this. It's absolutely remarkable. The trade war is not easy to resolve. We've probably got what I think of as a phase 0.5 deal the bare minimum coming very soon, a bigly good signing ceremony and, you know, the usual circus and theatre as we come to expect. But the rest of it's impossible to fix. Absolutely impossible. The rest of it being technology transfer. Let's just say very diplomatically how to incentivize better CCP behaviour when it comes to cyber espionage. That's a very tricky one. Very tricky. All right, James, well, why don't we bring it back home, at least home for me, and talk a little bit about what's going on here in the U.S. Right. And if I may, I just want to focus on the Fed because we've got a problem here. And let's just recap briefly the past several years with an important caveat. We'll start with the caveat, right? When we chatted in the summer of 2018, and you know, a lot of people know me as the plumbing guy, which is fantastic, and I appreciate that, but the plumbing that underpins the financial system, it's not static. It's dynamic. It's immensely complicated. And just when I'm tempted to think I've got it figured out, something else comes up or I learn something different. So it's an iterative process to try and understand it all and then try and piece it together. And as much as some people out there are labeled as experts on the plumbing or experts on the financial system, in my experience, going back to AIG, FP and elsewhere, I think it pays to be very humble about how this all works. So what follows is some broad observations because clearly something is not quite right in the financial system. Something's not quite right. Now, from the G20 meeting in Pittsburgh way back in 2009, the whole process of post-crisis regulation has been about ensuring we never have another Lehman. That's the understandable objective of the politicians – Fix it. So that can't happen again. So what did that mean? Regulated banks have higher liquidity buffers. Regulated banks have broadly less leverage. Regulated banks have more equity. Regulated banks have bail-inable debt because the taxpayers shouldn't be liable for any of this nonsense. Fair enough. And then in hand in hand with that, we will seek to reduce counterparty risk from derivatives by getting more and more of these derivatives centrally cleared. All of that makes sense, but one of my concerns over the past 10 years is that there's a lot of feedback loops here, and as much as the political imperatives were there, understandably, to prevent another Lehman, and as much as some central banks have said, oh, no, 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 we've thought about all this and feedback loops, and if the cost of funding goes up, that's an intended consequence, etc., 
it's not obvious to me that the cumulative impact of 10 years of post-crisis regulatory tightening has been adequately calibrated and adequately thought through. Now let's leap forward to 2017. And a very savvy person called Jay Powell, who at the time was just Governor Jay Powell, he helps the US Treasury write a paper on how they might need to rethink some of the post-crisis regulation. And I won't go into the details, but I think because he co-authored that paper on some of the little tweaks that regulators in this country might wish to do to make the financial system more efficient, I think that's why he was nominated as chairman of the Fed. My sense is that Chairman Jay Powell and his colleagues were quite optimistic that they could make some relatively minor recalibrations of post-crisis regulation. They could not. They were unable to do it. And the reason I flag all of that is because here we are, deep already into the 2020 campaign. And if we thought it was impossible for the Fed to make even minor tweaks to post-crisis regulatory tightening or some recalibration, one would think it's going to be even more difficult in 2020 to find the political cover to do so. We shall see. Now, to get a little bit technical, for some time now, the Fed has been running a monetary regime based on ample reserves. Now, we're not going to go into the weeds, but basically what is the minimum amount of central bank reserves, aka deposits with the New York Fed, that's required to run the US financial system in an efficient way? Unsurprisingly, when the Fed's buying a lot of assets, reserves in the system are going up. We all know that. And when the Fed's letting their balance sheet wind down, then reserves in the system are declining. As we came through the tail end of 2018, the Fed started to guesstimate what was the minimum amount of reserves the US financial system required to function smoothly. By April last year, it was clear that something wasn't quite right in the financial system. You started to see some of these overnight interest rates in the United States do some strange things. So that was an early warning that perhaps the minimum amount of reserves that the US financial system required was far higher than anyone thought. And then you come into September and fellow plumbers knew or guessed some time out, so from early 29 onwards, that perhaps around September 2019, balance sheets would be tight, there'd be a lack of capacity in the system and so forth. So a few things might go bump in September. But no one anticipated that overnight interest rates, off which so many financing costs are set, would do what they did, going from 2 to 10%. And that served as a tremendous wake-up call for the Fed. It's like, oh dear, we have just identified, we have crashed headlong into the minimum amount of reserves that the financial system requires. In fact, we've gone too low. So here's the easy bit to all of this, Ted. If I'm operating a financial system, a monetary system, if you will, based on ample reserves, and I, the New York Fed, or the Federal Reserve System, are the only people that can create or destroy those reserves, I can fix the problem. So how do I create reserves? Well, I do two things. I go out there and buy a lot of T-bills and absolutely swear on my heart that it's not QE. I am buying T-bills to grow reserves in the system and they told us this in October last year, and I will keep buying them through April 2020 because I want to get the reserves in the system back up to at least where they were, not in September 2019, but ideally in April 2019. So on the one hand, we know that there's a shortcut to fix this. We discovered, unhappily, that there was a shortage of reserves in the system. The Fed responded to that not just by growing their balance sheet via T-bill purchases, which credits the deposit accounts that the bank counterparties have at the New York Fed, but also to provide repo liquidity to help the system recalibrate. And as we read, they did that in a tremendous scale over the turn of 2019 because people were very worried about lack of balance sheet capacity. So Ted, from the one hand, if this is simply a problem of inadequate reserves in the system, who cares? I mean, who cares? The Fed can just grow reserves, job done, move on, nothing to see here, 
back to normal. Okay, but what if it's not a problem about reserves? What if there's something else going on? And unsurprisingly, there's something else going on. And it's very difficult to know how the Fed fixes it other than endless balance sheet expansion. Not good. And in this litigious compliance regulation driven age, the last thing any regulated financial institution can afford to do is to fail any part of a stress test, whether it be in Europe or the UK. It is embarrassing, it's shameful, and if you're in the executive suite and you fail any part of the stress test, you're toast. So what am I doing? If I'm a bank, I'm not solving for a leverage ratio or that's part of my regulatory burden. I'm not solving for a liquidity buffer. I can go down the list of regulations. What's critical to me is solving for the stress test and the stress test parameters. So, of course, the Fed over the past several years has tried to move them around a bit and not give advance notice, which is absolutely the right thing to do. But it has emerged that for stress test purposes, the guidance that the Fed has been giving regulated banks, and the biggest banks in particular, is that we would like you to hold a minimum amount of central bank deposits with us at all times. So reserves that have to have a flawed, if you will, at the New York Fed. So take the example of Jamie Dimon, and I think I've got this number right. He announced to the world last November that the minimum amount he's required under stress test guidance to keep at the New York Fed is approximately $60 billion. And then you think about the guidance that every other bank is getting. Is it any wonder that we need a very large amount of central bank reserves to make the whole show work? Okay, It's a higher number than people thought. And here's the rub, Ted. The New York Fed can monitor every bank's deposits in real time. And unsurprisingly, on any given day, there's payment and settlement cycles. So, you know, at the end of the day, JP Morgan will ensure that they're well above 60-odd billion, but during the day, it'll ebb and flow. But of course, my buffer's not 65 billion. Can you imagine what alarm bells go off at the New York Fed to just use this hypothetical JP Morgan example? If they see this account starting to tick down through 67 billion, 66.2, 65.9, Wait a minute, what the hell's happening here, right? Uh Uh-oh. So what do you do? You add a buffer on top of it. It might double it. So the stress test guidance is one thing, but I have a margin of safety on top of that. And the point I'd make here is that I'm trying to articulate to listeners how complicated some of this is and how to think about it. And central bank reserves, aka deposits at the New York Fed, are not just valuable for regulatory reasons. They're extremely valuable for settlement reasons, and payments and everything else. But where I come out is that what was most astonishing about last September is not that we had this conniption. It's that we had an overnight interest rate go from 2 to 10% and nobody could do anything about it. I mean, once upon a time, someone would have come in and said, that is so easy. I can just lend into this squeeze. This is ridiculous. Something that's trading at 2%, I can lend at 10% as a no-brainer and nobody can do it. And what we've got today is a US financial system that runs through a handful of large banks and large balance sheets. And largely as intended, the pipes through this are much more restricted than they were in the lead up to 2007. But it seems we've got a larger problem here because the discussion around last September has been somewhat narrowly focused on A, what went wrong, And B, it's all a question of financing treasuries, overnight repo markets as pertains to treasury securities. But the broad point is this isn't just a problem for treasury repo markets and related securities. Everything must be collateralized, not just for central clearing, but for hedge funds and everything else. Everything that makes the financial system work today is underpinned by collateral. And that, to me, is the big question mark over what happened with regards to Treasury repo markets in September. What does it tell us about capacity constraints in collateral markets more broadly? Because repo tends to be narrowly defined. 
But there's this whole other gigantic ecosystem out there involving collateral transformation and in the broader sense, securities financing transactions. That's absolutely critical to enable the financial system to settle their obligations in good time. The collateral required, the increasing amount of collateral required to underpin all those positions that are centrally cleared, initial margin, variation margin. And if we don't ensure that all this collateral can move when it needs to move, then we have a really big problem on our hands. So what's the real problem here? Now, just to cut to the so what. Okay, great. So we've got a plumbing problem here. Great. So what? Well, from the very narrow perspective, the Fed's balance sheet is increasing. Rule number one of the past 10 years or so is do not pick a fight with a central bank. So whether there's actually any mechanical flow from the Fed's balance sheet increasing to Tesla or whatever, the answer is there isn't. But the signaling effect is all that matters. The Fed's balance sheet's growing. And just to think about what's happening here, because it's complicated. On the one hand, if this is simply a problem of what is an adequate, or as the Fed says, ample amount of reserves to make the system work, the Fed can fix it by growing reserves in the system. That's not in doubt. And to be clear, investors everywhere would rejoice if the Fed's balance sheet continues to grow. Again, there's no mechanical feed through because it's reserves which are endogenous to the financial system. They can't be lent out. Well, they can be lent between banks and the Fed, but they can't be lent out. But the signaling effect, as we're, I think we're already seeing, is very profound. But if it's a regulatory problem, we need to be very attentive here. And I obviously think that this is a regulatory problem that's not easy to fix. Now, on the one hand, as we discussed earlier, Fed bank supervisors can say, look, we will soften our guidance somewhat on the minimum amount of central bank reserves, aka deposits in the New York Fed, you must hold at our time. Okay. You might, if you're very lucky and have political cover, tweak one part of the leverage ratio, for example. But the reason this September repo conniption, I think, is problematic because of what it may signal or be warning us about in regards to a tightly regulated financial system's ability to not just intermediate and finance US Treasury securities, but to recycle and intermediate all the collateral all day long that's required to make our financial system function. And that's what I'm worried about. Now, I know that sounds a little dramatic. And as we said two years ago, I've spent most of the past five years when people ask me about the plumbing saying, don't worry about that. Or I know people are excited about that, but it doesn't matter. Move on, focus on your mandate, don't be distracted. This is different. And the New York Fed, I thought would be able, and perhaps they did too, to step out of their repo generosity by now. They're still doing it. Now, maybe by March or April, they might be able to step out of this repo facility. But then where does the other capacity come from? Either supplying treasury collateral or supplying cash to make the system work when there are many other things I might wish to park my short-term dollars in, for example, FX swaps, but we won't get into that today. And if, as some people are strongly suggesting, the Fed's way to address this is to provide a standing repo facility, well, what political cover does the Fed have in 2020 to create what looks a bit like a 2008-style backstop to help banks manage their balance sheets and downstream leverage to hedge funds. It's a tricky one. And assuming they can overcome that, then what is the cost of this facility? And if everyone becomes accustomed to a hypothetical standing repo facility at the New York Fed, then what's the risk it sucks dollars from elsewhere, such as from the FX swap markets? Now, again, there's a number of questions here. I don't know the answer yet, but I suspect there's a much deeper problem regarding the events of last September. To be clear in the near term, 
the Fed can address it by growing reserves. So move on, focus on your job, buy more Tesla at wherever it is now. Look, who knows? Like, you know what? Tactically, who cares? But I would suggest to listeners that they need to keep a close eye on this. Asset allocators need to be on the front foot with their custodians. They need to be thinking about how their securities are being used and reused. And they need to think deeply about what this might be telling us about the capacity of our financial system today, again, to intermediate all the collateral that's required to make it work. And the last point on that is that we've had more and more derivatives centrally cleared over the past several years. No bad thing. But you require more and more collateral to make that work, to hold your positions and clear your positions. And the last bit of these new clearing regimes or margin requirements, if you will, for the trickiest part of the stock of derivatives out there are coming into effect in the middle of this year and then next year. And that will require even more ability to intermediate and get this collateral back and forth through the system. So I'm paying close attention. I'm wondering about what this all means. I'm continuing to investigate it. I'm thinking deeply about it. And I'm scrubbing off notes I was writing 10 years ago to remind myself of how this all works because I think it matters. And I think, to be clear, there's a short-term fix from the Fed, but the longer-term fix, most unfortunately for the Fed, may require them to be a semi-permanent feature of markets in terms of either, unfortunately, a standing repo facility or permanent repo facilities for various tenants, or simply not just buying T-bills, but buying US Treasury coupons outright. And you and I both know, the Fed starts buying coupons, this party is going to continue. But from a very practical plumbing perspective, that would be a horrible day for the Fed, because they'd effectively be doing quantitative easing, even if they say it's not. It would look to the world like the Fed's doing quantitative easing to alleviate a regulatory problem. And that's not a good place to be. All right, James, with that, just fascinating as always, I've got just a few closing questions for you that we didn't touch the last time. So here we go. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? I hope the kids are not tuning in, but one of my favorite hobbies up until recently used to be red wine. I'm not sure who's sponsoring this podcast, but no, look, it's I'm going to be a little bit boring and say, I've just always loved the reading, but we know that. I find it very soothing and relaxing. Yes, to be fair, some nice red wine from time to time as we've enjoyed, and it's great, great for conversation and everything else, great for friends. I don't know if you classify it as a hobby or not, but uninterrupted time with the kids. Great. How do you use social media professionally? Reluctantly. There is so much garbage out there, and as intended – Social media incentivizes the worst in all of us. It's all about the lowest common denominator. It's all about narcissism. It's all about look at me. I found myself going down the rabbit hole too much. I found myself inadvertently spending too much time on Twitter in particular. I do not use LinkedIn. I do not use Facebook. I avoid it like the plague. But Twitter has this remarkable power to suck you in. Scrolling that scroll down refresh is like playing a slot machine. Oh, was anyone like me? I'll have another ching on that. I have, through a lot of trial and a lot of error, found one or two people on social media who you might classify as reliable, either because I know them or because they're actually talking about the facts in finance, but there's not many. And I'm a reluctant user of social media. I post extremely infrequently. I observe the behaviors of others and perhaps a little bit naughtily. The greatest use of social media, the greatest utility from social media for me is understanding when the group thinking consensus narrative has gone overboard. Whether, for example, it be about this repo situation, people getting a little bit hot and bothered, and understanding when the, I guess you call it the narrative skew on financial Twitter has gone a bit overboard, Brexit or some of the other things we talked about. I try to limit it. I have taken the Twitter app off my iPhone and I've tried to make it almost impossible for me to log on and I have done an override on our broadband coming into our home so none of us, neither the wife nor children nor me, can access any of it. All right, last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? There's two things and to be boringly consistent, one of them would absolutely be I should have read even more. I should have been much more diligent and programmatic in my reading even though I read a hell of a lot and that's perhaps a lesson for 
anyone listening in who's a little bit younger getting into investment management, get into it, read and read and read and compound your knowledge and your benefit. And the second thing is just simply don't worry about things you can't control. Let them go. Life's short. Get after it. Get out there. Go crush it. Just, you know, if people are getting all wound up, just let it go. Right? Simple as that. James, thanks so much. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope you found a nugget or two to take away and apply in your investing and your life. If you'd like what you heard, please tell a friend and maybe even write a review on iTunes. You'll help others discover the show, and I thank you for it. Have a good one, and see you next time. Thank you.